Amen. Are you happy to be in the house? Amen. Amen. The house of the Lord. It's a good thing. Amen. Amen. It's a good thing to come together and worship the Lord. I want to give you a scripture in my Colossians 3.23. Just spent all afternoon, all afternoon at Bueller concerts. And, uh, you know, glory to God. We've got kids with talents. Amen. And, and they're using them for good. Um, we got to hear the choir and their contest pieces they were doing. And then we got to go hear the band. And uh, it, was, it was a great afternoon. But I kept thinking, man, I want my kids to use their gifts for the Lord. Yes. And then God told me, I want you to use your gifts for me too. You know, we're supposed to use our gifts as unto the Lord. And so the verse says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's a mighty God we serve. Yes. Amen. And he is worthy of praise tonight. And let's just set our hearts aright again. Worship the Lord with all that we have. And let him fill us up so that we can serve him even greater as we go from this place this week. Amen. Do you want that tonight? Yes. Amen. Lift your hands to him. Let's allow him to come in and fill us up. Lord Jesus, have your way with us. Holy Spirit, we're here to worship and adore you. Father God, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, for all that you've yet to do. Most importantly, we just worship you because you're God. We give you all of our praise tonight. Receive our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
I can only imagine what it would be when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only
Good to see everybody. All the angels and the few humans that are really ready for a revival. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know what? That's what we do. We serve him every week. Amen. Day in and day out. Amen. The Bible says we're to join together more often as we see the day of Christ approaching. And I don't know what some Christians are doing now. They must think that this is going to be business as usual. But I'm telling you, as somebody who's studied the signs of the end times for years and years, Jesus is coming soon. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Things must go this way. You say, what do you mean? Well, crazy town for the world, but for us, it's looking up because Jesus is coming. Amen? I don't know how much longer God can allow what's going on in the earth. There's so many things that uh, even some of us are better off not knowing what's happening. But Jesus knows what's happening. And you know what? He is what's happening. Amen? Do you love him tonight? Praise God. I don't know if Sister Joy is watching it all today or she picks up this broadcast, but I just want to tell you, Sister Joy, if you happen to listen to any of our broadcasts this week, we just want to tell you, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you in Jesus' name. We just bless you and pray that God will just extend your time on this earth for as long as Jesus tarries until he comes back. Amen. And so that you can do all the things that God has placed in your heart. What an inspiration you are, and you truly are, Sister Joy. So we just want you to know we love you. Amen. How many of you would clap your hands to that and say, we love you, Joy. Amen. God bless. Hallelujah. If you didn't get an opportunity to give, baskets are in the back. And we're just going to go ahead and release the kids to go on back and turn it over to our wonderful pastor. He's got a good message. Amen. And you know what? You're blessed to be here. I, I'm telling you, it's good. You know what? You get all the anointing, all the good word. It's just going to go right in. It's not going to be watered down because you're going to get the you're going to get the brunt of it tonight, and it's going to be a good thing. Amen. It's a good thing to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's a good thing. I thank God that we're able to still meet together and worship God as our heart and the word of God dictates. Amen. There's some places around the world where they got to sneak around to love the Lord, but right now. We can do it in the open, and we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ here at Victorious Life Church, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And I just thank God that we've had the circumcision of the heart, and we've been included into the family of God. And that, that study we've been doing in faith and talking about Abraham, praise God. Uh, we are Abraham's children, amen. We are his heritage uh, even as the Lord told him, your seed will be as the sands of the earth, as the stars of the heaven. And praise God, we're a part of that. So you're a star tonight and you're a piece of crystal sand. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap as pastor comes on up. Hallelujah. Thank you, my friend. We're going to always my friend, my pastor and my friend. Amen. Sometimes... Sometimes I talk with Pastor Jim more during the week than I talk to my wife. Amen. Sometimes and you're like, maybe that should, well, we just, uh, sometimes it's just, you, you have good relationships and good friendships. And we're going to, we're going to go back. We're going to go over to Ephesians chapter four. We're going to recap a couple things. I'm going to kind of continue in what we started on Wednesday nights here uh, a few weeks ago. Um, talking about the church leadership in the church, among the church. Um, Pastor Jim brought something out uh, super well this morning that uh, we got to be faithful in the little things. Can you say amen? amen. And God will make us ruler over much. And uh, in my time of serving the Lord, um, seeing folks with gifts, talents, potential, um, abilities, um, talents, anointings, and uh, they got out of order or they got the cart before the horse. How many of you guys know we can't get the cart before the horse? And uh, they looked at the day of small beginnings as something to look down their nose at instead of starting where they're at and letting God give the increase. We're going to talk about leadership and leadership in the church tonight. Um, let's pray. Father, we love you. We glorify you. We honor you, Lord. We thank you uh, that you've established the church, Lord God, as an embassy of heaven, Lord God. Lord God, we I pray for all the churches around the this area, Lord God, those in our state, uh, around our nation that are lighthouses, uh, that are beacons of hope 
uh, for a lost and dying world, Lord God. Lord God, and we thank you that you've uh, adopted us into your family and, and we're part of your church, which is the bride of Christ. Lord, and we're looking for that wedding day. But while we're here, Lord, you've commanded us uh, to occupy till you come. So Lord God, we're gonna get about doing your business until we hear that trumpet sound. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes this, and he gave himself, and he, he, that's Jesus, himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man in the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Are we there yet? No. No. <laughs> Far from it. That, so guess what? If we're not there yet, we still need those gifts that God's given the church. Can you say amen? amen? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trick, trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Such a, uh, I've unpacked this a couple Wednesdays or a few Wednesdays in a row, uh, but want to just uh, bring this back so we have something to anchor off of. Um, hallelujah. And the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Can you say amen? amen. Acts chapter 2, uh, Holy Spirit rains down and pours out upon that upper room and those that were followers of Jesus that heeded the voice of Jesus and stayed in Jerusalem, tarried in Jerusalem, sought and prayed and looked for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, we're in that time period right now during our natural season of the time after Passover, before Pentecost. They waited, they listened to the Lord. They were all, and according to Acts chapter two, they were all in one accord. They were in unity together, seeking what Jesus had promised them. The Holy Spirit poured down and the church on that day, 5,000 were added and it was, a, it was an exponential explosion and awesome things happened on that first day of Pentecost. Can you say amen? And, and if you read through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts spans decades. If some of you may not be aware of that, like when we look at, when we're reading scripture, we're going through our Bible in a year plan, we're seeing scripture and we see chapter like it's day, 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 or episode of a show, episode of a show, episode of a show. And what we don't see is like the book of Acts probably spans at least 30, if not 40 years contained in that book. And the church started out as this, as this wildfire of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church. And it didn't take long before the, the apostles realized they needed some structure. They needed some, they needed something more. And early in the book of Acts, you, you'll come to some scriptures where, where the apostles are all about the ministry. Cause people were like, these apostles, they walked with Jesus. They're, they're a voice uh, from God to us. And the apostles were doing everything. Can you say amen? They were teaching. They were leading prayer. I'm sure they were leading worship. Uh, they were attending to the widows and orphans. And eventually, early on, they got so uh, involved into the practical things. Was, let me say this. The practical things of God are super important. Can you say amen? It's important that we take care of the practical things of the church. It's important that we have the air properly conditioned in here. Can you say amen? You're like, why not? Like, why? Because it's nice to have a building when it's cool like it is this morning to have a little bit of heat. And some of you are like, would you turn up the heat a little bit more? We try, we try sometimes. Um, on the other side, when it's 105 degrees outside, we want some coolness. Can you say Amen. It's important that we tend to uh, building improvements, the parking lot, um, making sure the bathrooms work well. All those are the practical things of the ministry that if they're not properly taken care of, it diminishes the quality of, of the ministry. Not only that, but it diminishes the quantity or the number of people that we can effectively minister to. Can you say amen? Yeah. So we gotta be about the practical things. At the same time, you have to have a group of people that are also tending to the spiritual things. Can you say amen? We can get so caught up in painting walls and changing out outlets and fixing doors and 
all the needful things that are around. And I guarantee you, I can walk around this place and I could probably make a list of a hundred things to fix. And, there, and I'd point out things that some of y'all wouldn't even think to notice. I'm like, oh, we need to fix that. That could use some paint. This needs to be, I could totally do that and get, get a group of guys, a group of, group of gals that are all on the practical things. But if we neglect the word of God, we neglect prayer, we neglect um, study, we neglect worship, then that also diminishes our ability to minister. Can you say amen? amen. And early on in the church, they were kind of shooting from the hip. But it didn't take long before God started speaking to the apostles and said, hey, we got apostles, we also need a level of deacons. We need servants. We need people who are on board with the vision that are about the Lord's business. They're like, we may not be, you know, uh, we may not have had that experience of walking with Jesus to the length that Peter, James, and John and Andrew and Bartholomew and all the other apostles had to that time. But we've been filled with the Holy Spirit and we got to get to work. And what you'll find out is, is that the first, as you read through the book of Acts, the first martyr in, recorded in the books of Acts isn't an apostle. It's not a family member of Jesus. It's a deacon by the name of Stephen. You're like, well, he's a deacon in the church. He was about the practical things. He was ministering to the widows and orphans. I'm sure he was taking care of what Peter, James, or John needed to do. It's like you call up Stephen. It's kind of like we got a few of the guys around here. Hey, there's a something. Somebody needs help changing a tire. Call this guy. He'll help you out. We need people like that in the body as well. But if you read through and you read uh, what Stephen shared right before he was martyred, it is one of the best sermons preached in the entire New Testament. And Stephen uh, captures basically everything about Jewish history, the highlights from the beginning of Genesis all the way until Jesus. And he lost his head in that moment. As the church matured and progressed, a, a better and a more consistent structure was added. And by the time we get here to the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, as he's meditated, he's prayed, as he's gotten revelation from the Holy Spirit, he's like, hey, God has given, Jesus has given himself to minister to his church these five gifts, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, and this is their purpose, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's our heart's desire as, as pastors here to share the knowledge, revelation, our talents, our giftings, our abilities, so that we can go out and we can, be, we can make disciples of the nations. Everybody wants to talk about, well, why, why aren't you doing? We got to be the church without walls. Break out and we got to have a crusade on this and we'll have a march on this and we'll have a food drive on this and we'll, we'll have a car wash for this and we'll do all these other things. And some of them may be of God, some of them just may be of habit. But this is also what I want to see. My heart's desire is have folks that come here that are taught the word of God that go to their place of business, or the place that they're working at. And I know they do here is they, they're part of a team of nurses. And they may have had a terrible week, as bad as all the other nurses. But they're able to go in there and they're able to share an encouraging word to one of their coworkers or to their colleagues and build them up and give them insight and not only our nurses, but our, our, those in administration or those that are taking care of other needs or just even in your own family, that's how we also become a church without walls. Can you say amen? So we, we limit it sometimes. Think, oh, we got to have 500 people in the parking lot all banging out to, you know, heavy bass music. And that's, this is, this is the idea of revival to me. This is, this is my idea. When someone says, you know what, I got, I got invited to be a part of this community board and I really didn't feel like I needed to be there and I felt kind of out of place and it really wasn't my thing, but I felt the prompting and leadership of the Holy Spirit to go ahead and say yes and reluctantly I obeyed. And there's a moment in a meeting where I know I had uh, divine grace upon me to share something specifically with this group 
and it, it encouraged or brought something up or built somebody up. That's also the definition of revival as we infiltrate the community that we're a part of. And it's about equipping the saints so that we can do the work of the ministry. Because guess what? I only have so many touches during the week. I'm limited in my touches. But collectively, 80, 90 people, we have thousands of touches in a week. Well, what's little Victorious Life Church doing? This is what we're doing. We're preaching the word the best we know how. We're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. We're ministering to widows and orphans. Like even my own family, adopting three kids, continued, continual ministry to my kids for over 15 years. That's awesome. It's, it's amazing to see, to have a conversation with my oldest as I, take, as I took him out for lunch. One thing that I've wanted to do with him and have started doing with him is take him out to lunch once a month. So him and I stay connected. Because when your kids move out of the house, things change. Can you say amen? amen? And sometimes you need to have some conversations so that you can make sure that you're kind of there to facilitate them before their world comes crashing down. <laughs> and you have the conversation as the parent before they come and go, I've lost everything. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to get something back when you've lost everything. But maybe if we have some... Anyways, but I was talking with him this last week and he had... And we're coming into having some real more adult conversations. Like, are you, are you disappointed we adopted you? Because you ask that as a parent sometimes. You're like, man, we, God brought you here. God blessed you. We, God blessed us with you, but you got separated from your siblings and from the biological family that you were born into. And those that don't understand adoption, there's still some roots and connections that go way deep. And just having a conversation like, are you, are you, are you disappointed or frustrated that we adopted you? And it, it didn't take him, but, take him but three seconds to go, absolutely not. He's like, I got to know a little bit of the family that I came from. And he said, they're weird. <laughs> And he said, they're not like us at all. <laughs> so he said, us, not. <laughs> he said, I went, he said, he shared with me, he said, I went to a, a birthday party of the child of his oldest sister. And he said, everybody else showed up to the birthday party with a bunch of cheap gifts. Because that's what their family did. He said, but him and his girlfriend went to the party and they bought him the best gift that they co could possibly afford. This giant Hot Wheels car track for a two-year-old kid that he barely knows. And, he, and, he, and it relayed this to me that he watched me and my wife do that for the gifts that we give. Because we always give above and beyond. Because God's been so generous to us that we want to be generous to others. That's how I know he's a part of my family. Can you say Amen. And, and there were times when I was younger, in my early 20s, that I had to have pastors, people with prophetic gifts, to equip me for the work of the ministry so that I could be better prepared to minister to a generation that was hurting and needing. And, and we're, we're trying to reciprocate that over and over and over again. And we're seeing that reproduced in our own ministry where we have many of our young people continuing to serve in the children's church and on our worship team. And it blessed my socks off to see Josiah up there tonight. Why? Because it's a miracle of God. Like, everybody, where's the miracles at? Guess what? There's a dad who was reunited with his wife who had a family that was delivered from drugs and alcohol and a life that was destined to fail that God restored so that he could be a godly man and bring his kids to church so his eight-year-old could sing his favorite song to the Lord. That is a miracle. 
That's the transformation. We, like that gets me just as excited as seeing someone else healed, healed of their body or being set free. Like because those types of miracles produces, produce legacies of faith that transcend generations. And, we, and God's given ministers and, and pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers, evangelists, so we can be equipped, so we can do this work of the ministry that we can be beacons of hope in our generation. And we're not there yet because we have not come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God completely. And people want to buck organization in the church. Can you say amen? People do. But I'll say this to those maybe listening. out. I know I'm talking to the choir tonight. You're with us. Don't speak out against the organized church. Are there, are there flawed people in the churches? Absolutely. We're all a bunch of crackpots. And inside these crackpots, God chooses to uh, fill us with the power of his Holy Spirit. What's the alternative of an organized church? Do you want a disorganized church? I don't, that, I'm not good for disorganization. Can you say amen? Like the, what, what if we had complete disorganization where nobody knew when we were going to meet? One week we meet Sunday, next week we're going to meet Tuesday. The following week we're going to meet on Thursday. Sometimes we're going to do it in the morning, sometimes we're going to do it in the evening, sometimes we're going to do it in the early hours before sunset, right, or right before sunrise. No, we have organization. Can you say amen? amen? We meet at scheduled times so that we can plan our lives so that we can gather together to worship. Amen. We have structure to our services. Yes, we, we, we open with the song of praise. Can you say amen? Because we enter in to his courts with thanksgiving into our, or enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and enter into his courts with praise. We start up and we offer up a prayer. Can you say amen? And there's a scripture reading and there's some more songs and we're clapping our hands. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And we take up an offering because our, 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 we worship not only with our voice and with our hands, but if we really worship with our heart, we also worship with our finances. So fi our, our generosity becomes an extension of our worship. Then we gather together for a family meal. This is our family meal. We get two for, two for the price of one on Sundays. Tell all your friends, you get two, two messages, one offering. This is the family meal. Can you say amen? And sometimes it's like no different than the family meal that we have. When we have family dinner at our house, that's what we're serving. And it's going to be mostly what everybody likes, but it might not be everything that everybody likes. But as you sit down for a family meal, you get to partake of what's served. Can you say amen? Because you, you get a wide group of people from diverse age, age ranges with, uh, with an eclectic background of life experiences, you're going to have a group of people that's mourning and hurting because they just had a loved one that passed away. Or one of their favorite aunts or uncles is in the hospital sick. Then on the other side, you have a young couple that's celebrating the birth of a new child. Or even Alan Patty, who's down uh, ministering to their daughter who just gave birth to their third child. So they're brand new grandparents. Amen. And you have a wide, I mean, the, for like the fourth, fifth time, something like that, sixth time, sixth grandkid. Way to go, Alan Patty. Another, another link in the chain. But, but you go through, you have this, and the message is going to come, and there's, there's going to be a portion of it that ministers to the folks that are mourning. And there's also going to be an encouragement for someone who's going through a tough time. And there's going to be some rejoicing for someone who's celebrating. And there may be the one time where it doesn't completely apply to you, but what I found out is, is that if everything doesn't completely apply to me, I take it in because maybe it's something I need to absorb so I can give to someone else. Because that word may not be right now for me. But I also know this, that sometimes the words that I got years ago, it took a long time for those seeds to manifest before I truly appreciated them. Can you say amen? And if I just let it go in one ear and out the other, no, it's just another service, just another Sunday. Pastor Craig, Pastor Jim, they're just kind of getting hyper on it. Well, let me say this. 
when you, when you can't get a hold of someone and your loved one needs prayer, you better be getting hyper. Because you may not have someone else to lean on in the moment to be hyper. And God's given gifts in the body. He's given leadership in the body for a reason. And it's not to control. It's not to manipulate. It's not to achieve our own ends. For this, this I know about, about our folks here. We do it out of love for God, love for the people of God. It's not for personal gain. <laughs> it, it's, it, is, it is not for personal gain. And at the same, like, we do it because I do it for this. Because I want to obey God. I want to be obedient to God. I, when I was 18, 19 years old, I had a pathway to where I could have chosen a path and got my engineering degree. Like, I know math. Like, good. Like, way better than the average person does. I was, in my high school, I was the top math and science student in all of Nickerson district the year I graduated. I, I actually got a perfect score on my math and science on my ACT. That's not a whole lot of people get that. So my brain was like, I got this practical knowledge. I could be an engineer. I can do long formulas. That's the carnal side of my brain. But the born again part of my heart was like, I got to obey the Lord. Like more important than being an engineer and figuring out how to build bridges or houses or whatever. It's like I got I to gotta obey what God's called me to do first and foremost. Amen. And you're talking two diverging salary courses. Just saying. <laughs> it's different. It's different. Just saying. Just knowing but not a single regret because whatever I give up on this side of heaven as a sacrifice, I'm going to get that much more and a bigger return. Can you say amen? And God's established leaders. So a few of the highlights here. I'm, you guys are slowing me down too much. God gave some, not all. Can you say Amen. Everyone's a minister, but not everyone is an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. Can, everyone's a minister. The root word of minister is servant. We're all called to be servants. Can you say amen? amen. That's the truth. We're all, there should be no job too small in the church for a servant to do. That's not to, I was trained up, I was trained up the right way as a, as a young man, as a young minister. And I started out by straightening up chairs, washing glasses, and picking up trash. That's what I started out doing, setting up tables and chairs in the back. And let me just say this, if we don't have anybody set up tables and chairs in the back for a dinner, guess who's going to do it? I'm going to do it. Um, if I see a piece of trash on the floor, I'm picking it up. If I see somebody's snotty rag that they leave by, I'm going to take another tissue and pick it up. <laughs> Just saying, empty water bottles, like no job too small. Like still to this day, I will still go through and check the restrooms for surprises that the older boys leave behind. Can you just say amen? That's part of being a servant. Like, well, you got, that's, no, we got to take care of the practical. That's even before preaching. I was trained up right. I, was, I, I know this for my training in, in ministry. I received some of, the, some of the highest standard training that would be out there. And I put it, I had to work and I took my lumps. Some of them I deserved. Some of them I took them because it's part of the job description. Um, but I'll say this, with the training that I received, it was on par with any, it was better than any Bible college I could have gone to or any missions organization I could have been a part of. And even at, even at this, was, this was, I was 17 years old, junior in high school. One of the things that I wanted to do, this is again separating out, or you get anything out of this tonight? I hope I'm not rambling. Separating out between what we want to do in our mind and obeying the call of God on our life. When I graduated, when I wanted, when I got out of high school, there's nothing more that I wanted to do than to go be an intern down at Teen Mania. Like that was the cool thing to do. 
It would have been the awesome thing. Go spend a year, travel the country, uh, minister to thousands, hundreds of thousands of teenagers, be a part of their be a part of their deal. What they were doing back in the in the late 90s and what they're doing in the late 90s was a lot better than what they did towards the end of their ministry. Nothing more that I wanted to do than just be a part of that movement. We had young people from our own body go be a part of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gabe's Uncle Ben was, a, was an intern down there for a couple years and was on staff for several years, and he's been blessed for it. And, and I can, he got a wife out of it, so that's not too bad. If you get your ministry and you get the girl, double blessing. Uh, but I can remember I was standing at the, the concourse at the Maybe Center getting ready to leave, and you had the, the, the gal there who's recruiting people to come sign people up to get information to become an intern and give $6,000 so you can live down in Texas in swampy, hot, red clay Texas for a year. And I looked her in the eye, and I was like, God didn't call me to do that. God told me I was going to get the training at my church. the born again side of me, that was exactly what needed to be said. The carnal part of my mind was like, no, what did you just say? That's not what, that's why we're, that's why we wrestle with this dichotomy sometimes. Can you say amen? Where our mind wants to do something, but the heart, our heart of heart says, no, that's not right. But your mind's like, you made plans. You intended to do this. You know you're going to get something good out of it. You know what? If I would have obeyed, I don't know what, I, or if I would have disobeyed. What if I would have disobeyed? I may have been blessed at a certain level, but I wouldn't be blessed at the level that I am today. And I know this in my own life is like not heeding that voice of God as we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We can miss divine appointments and glorious connections. If I go to K-State to get my engineering degree or I go down to Teen Mania to become an intern for a year, I don't know who I meet and who I hang around with. And I may miss out on the wife that God called me to be with. And if I miss out on my wife, I miss out on the three kids we get to adopt. And their destinies are changed. I believe that it is that critical that God puts certain on-ramps and on-ramps and off-ramps in our walk of grace with him, that there's some decisions that are like mission critical to the success of what we're going to do for the kingdom. And there may be divergent paths, not talking like multiverse, but there may be different paths that we could go down that God's kind of going to go, yeah, that was pretty, that was okay, you loved me. But I believe this, that it, when we get to heaven and we're at the Bama seat, it's not just going to be our trying of our works, but it's also going to be the time where God kind of shows us like, hey, you had some other choices. And this is what kind of could have been had you listened and heeded. Like, like there's sometimes our, in our lives is like there's certain people that we shouldn't give our phone number to. Can you say amen? Right? Because if you don't give them your number, then you don't end up in a toxic relationship with them. And then you don't end up with all these soul ties that affect us for decades. Like that, like to that level. Can you say amen? Now, does God redeem our times? Absolutely. I know I'm getting off. But God gave some, not all. Everyone's a minister. Not everyone is part of the fivefold. The purpose is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We supply, we pre prepare, we train, we outfit those that are part of the church of God. Can you say amen? So we're, we can do something. It's for the building of the body of Christ. We always say this here, that we are stronger together. A simple, a simple uh, example. When the band is together, it sounds better. Can you say amen? When the harmonies are together, it sounds better. It, it sounds worse like, some, like y'all know what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. You might not know why it doesn't. Others, here, others might know why it doesn't. But you kind of go, ah, that doesn't sound. Like if I don't play the right bass note. Pastor Jim goes crazy on the drum. Or, yeah, or, or and, I'm in, and Pastor Lori's playing a different note on the piano. And if I choose to play whatever I want to play, it's going to sound off. And then she's going to look over at me. 
And she's going to go, play the G. Play the G. Not the B flat. Play the G. Why? Because we're stronger together. We're, we're weaker when we're all doing our own thing. The vocals are weaker if they're all just singing whatever part they want to sing. Somebody's going to sing. If everybody wanted to sing all the different parts of the melody. And then somebody, but, but that's not the way it works together. Can you say amen? When Pastor Jim and I are in sync together on the drums, if he's playing a more complicated beat, I'm playing something simpler. I do. I do. Well, because, because it, because if you're super complicated and I'm super complicated, then we kind of can clash, but it's, it gets us to where we're, what's that? No, you're good. No, you're good. I'll, I, I like adjusting. But it gets us to where we're stronger together. Can you say amen? And that same microcosm that happens within a worship team also happens in the body. We don't all get to choose everything we want to do all the time. Can you say amen? Like there's times to give tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophetic words. In the middle of someone preaching or teaching, that is not the time. Can you say amen? It's, it's not the moment for it. You may have the gift. You may have the prompting. You may just need to hold it till a different time, part of the service. Can you say amen? It's, it's not the time. We don't just sing whatever song we want to sing. We sing a song in unison together. One song. So we come together as a reflection that God brings us together in unity. So we can be stronger together. When I'm working on a job crew, not everybody does the same job. Just doing a roof this last week. One of us is pulling nails. The other guy's tearing off. Another guy's cleaning up after the, off the ground. Another guy's cleaning out the gutters. When we get that done, we'll all do something a little bit different. But not everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. If we we're all doing the same thing at the same time, it would take forever for it to get done. And it works better when we're together. A unity of the faith, the knowledge of Jesus. The per, another purpose is this, is so that we mature in our faith. Which means we don't remain immature. There are certain behaviors. We're at, going out for a restaurant today. There's a, a little girl about 18 months old screaming her head off at the restaurant. It's ex I won't say it's acceptable, but it's, it's more reasonable to think an 18-year-old is just screaming anything that comes out of their mouth. Would you say amen? Like, why? Well, she, she hasn't learned how to talk yet. She doesn't have words. She's expressing herself in a way that's getting the attention that she's desiring. It may be good attention. I'm sure it brings a little embarrassment to her parents. You got other people looking over your shoulders, like kids not behaving at, at, a, at going out to eat. There's a reason why we took our kids out to eat once a year for the first until they were over 10. <laughs> once a year. And every year at Christmas when we took them out, we do, we, my wife and I, we have a tradition in our family. The night after we have, or the night of play practice, we have play, Christmas play practice on a Saturday morning. That evening, we take our kids out to we'll look at Christmas lights and go out for a family dinner. And normally in the night with some hot chocolate. It's a tradition we've done for, for years that the kids all look forward to. I remember one specifically, we're taking them out as soon as Olive Garden came to town. And I sit them down, we're going to Olive Garden with the whole crew. And within five minutes, the water's knocked on the, off the table. As soon as the food's out, the pizza that was delivered is upside down on the floor. Napkins all over the place. Everybody's getting up, acting squirrely. And I'm just like trying to hold it together. And then I get the bill. <laughs> and it's like $85 for the bill. And I had to give a good tip. Not like the, not, it, it didn't matter about the service, like, 20% was a minimum with what this server had to deal with. It's like, so it's like $100 bill for this dinner that I'm completely miserable at. And I, and I found out this, I can be miserable at home for free. And I don't need to go spend 100 bucks at a restaurant so I can be miserable. 
but it's okay. It's not okay, but it puts it in context if someone's immature. If it was a teenager doing the same thing. I'm talking a, a functioning teenager, knocking off their water, throwing pizza on the floor. Unacceptable. Grown man, grown woman. I know we got people that you could give stories. I'm sure Gabe's got stories of people just acting the fool at, uh, at the restaurant. Is that right, young man? And you're going, you're acting like the kid. But it goes like the reason why is because they're immature and they haven't developed or they haven't got to a certain place. And part of preaching and teaching is so that we come to a maturity in the faith. So that when we go through the storms of life, it's like, you know what? The winds are going to come. The rain's going to come down. The floodwaters are going to come up. My boat's going to get rocked a little bit. But guess what? Jesus is the captain of my ship. I'm staying on course with him. I, I feel like I'm being tossed to and fro by the waves that are all around me, but I'm not double-minded in my thinking. I have my faith set upon him. He's the author. He's the finisher of my faith. He's not through with me yet. You know what? This is a bummer that this is happening, but it does not change the truth of God's word. It does not, it does not alter what God says about me. I'd like it to be better, but I know that God works all things together for my good. Even if the good is, I see that God is still faithful in the midst of the storm. And I can take that as a testimony to someone else and go, you know what? I've been there before. I've been abandoned. I've been abused. I've been victimized. I've been hurt. I've been wounded. But God has always been faithful, and he's walked with me through each and every step of the process. I'm not complete yet, but I'm better than I used to be. So let me tell you this. You don't have to stay where you're at. If you give Jesus the will of the ship, he will get you to where you need to be. And if I can find that level of maturity and go, things are not all right, but they're going to be all right, then I'm moving farther ahead than if I would have just remained and thrown in the cards and just cry and throw my temper tantrum. Can you say amen? A maturity in the faith. It stabilizes us. Good preaching, a good church stabilizes someone's life. It does. It absolutely does. I believe this because I've seen the evidence in my own life. Some of y'all know the family that I grew up in. Some of my family wasn't much different than a lot of everybody else's family, but church became one of the, was the most stable community that I was a part of for the entirety of my life. Truly was, truly has been, and continues to be so. It's like, why? Because I know that every Sunday morning, I've got a reset happening to my week. It's reset. We're celebrating the resurrection. We're preaching the gospel. We're worshiping the king. I get my life, I, I get to reset my life. The night, the, I get two for one. I get a Sunday night service too. And when I was a young man, I, even now, before, before I was a, a, an assistant pastor, or associate pastor, or whatever, I, whatever my title was, before any of those things, I didn't want to miss Sunday night because I didn't, I didn't want to miss out on what God was going to do. Remember when Sunday night was like that? I'm not saying it's not like that now. But there's a time it's like, you know what? I'm going to go because someone's going to get, someone might get healed that we've been praying for. Someone might get filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't, want to, I don't just want to hear about them that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. I actually want to see it with my eyes. Like, I, I don't want to miss out on the weighty presence of God. Like, I, I don't know. We could be singing Revelation song that night where we're singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That becomes a heartbeat song and an anthem. It's like, I love the way our band does it. And I think it's one of the best versions out there. I truly do. All the other ones are kind of compared to the way we play it. Just being honest. It's not just because I'm on, it's not because I'm up there, it's because I really like it. And I don't want to miss those things. <laughs> I wasn't back then. I was, I, I was a reluctant bass player. I got a guitar when I was 16 years old and learned how to play a, on a little old Yamaha in, in the back. It's actually still, in my, it's in my office right now. 
with a cracked neck. It's had a cracked neck for 27 years. Never been fixed, may never be fixed. And we didn't have a bass player, but I knew where the notes were. And it just starts out with the pluck here. And I was okay with rhythm because I, I was a band, I was in band, so I at least knew rhythm and I could count time in my head. But you just start out with a note, start out with the note, and then pretty soon you're there and you get the look and go play the G. And <laughs> you're like, okay, I'll, I'll get on. And then it'll be like, turn it down. You're playing too. Anyways, that's how, we, that's how we work together. Can you say amen? And then all of a sudden you realize you can do this and this. Oh, and then you can play these notes with these notes. And then you can play these notes in sequence. And then all of a sudden you get a little bit better and a little, a little bit more proficient. And then pretty soon there comes a time where you're not looking at music and you're just looking at the piano player's left hand to know where they're going. And it just, it's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Because let me just say this, like continual improvement is way better than waiting for the perfect plan. Like just getting a little bit better every week, every month, every year is way better than delayed perfection. If we're, waiting for, if we're waiting for everything to be perfect before we do anything for the Lord, you're never going to do anything for the Lord. <laughs> like, but I still got, I still struggle with my anxiety and I still have my, the days where I can't get out of bed. And I still struggle with my finances and I'm and this and like when, God, when, when I can walk out without any fear and I, there's always a happy place in my heart and, and I don't owe anybody any money, then, then I can really do something for you, Lord. When, when everything is right, then, then, I can, then, I can, then I can be who you called me to be. It's not about waiting till everything is perfect. Because if you read through the Gospel of John, the first evangelist was a woman in John chapter 4 who had been married multiple times to the point of where basically she had lost count of how many times she had been married. Not only that, but she was Samaritan and she didn't have a covenant the way the Jews had a covenant. And she wanted to argue with Jesus that they should worship in Bethel instead of Jerusalem. And Jesus didn't just tell her, tell her that she was wrong. She said, everybody's wrong. Because the day is coming when you're not going to worship at this place, this mountain, or this mountain. But the day is coming when the true worshipers are going to worship me in spirit and in truth. He said, guess what? The Samaritans got it wrong and the Jews got it wrong too. Because Jesus came to enact a new covenant based on better promises. And once through revelation, she realized that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the, one, the anointed one whom God had sent. She went and she told everybody what Jesus had told her, like, Jesus read my mail. Like, there hadn't been a prophet like Jesus in 400 years. Can you say Amen. Did she have to wait till her life was in order before she started telling her community about who Jesus was? Yep. No, she just knew she met Jesus and everybody else needed to meet him too. Amen. Peter didn't have everything in order. Andrew, James, they didn't have everything in order. John didn't have everything. Like they had a meddling mother-in-law that was trying to get, on, get in with Jesus. Like, Jesus, when you enter into your kingdom, make sure you got my two sons who have followed you and forsaken everything and let them be a part of your cabinet and let them be a part of the ones that help you rule. And they became martyrs for the Lord, the sons of thunder. And John writes the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the revelation of Jesus. They started where they were at. Are you getting anything out of this tonight? I'm not getting too far. So we, we're no longer immature, so that means it's time to grow up. I mean, sometimes i got to set my feelings aside because there's bigger kingdom business that needs to be done. Sometimes we got to be, sometimes we got to 
have the courage to keep our mouth shut instead of correcting everybody. Can you say amen? We've got to be mindful of our words, not hand out backhand compliments like they're Skittles. Some people are, some people are just terrible at handing backhand compliments. Well, you're a good cook for someone who's not a chef. Can you say amen? You're a pretty good athlete for a girl. Like, how would, how would that set? Well, you're, 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 Craig, you're, you're a good bass player for someone who's never taken lessons. <laughs> like, but how, but if you give a compliment to someone like that, like, that outfit looks nice on you, except that it's red. <laughs> And some people just hand those things out. And why? A lot of it is is because they're immature and insecure in their own selves. Can you say amen? amen? Stabilize. Jesus is setting the course. And no matter what, we speak the truth in love. A couple things here that leaders do. Leaders set the direction and cast the vision. Can you say amen? That's, what, that's one of the components of leadership. No matter what level of leadership that you're at, you set direction and cast vision. Fathers in homes cast vision for their home and set the direction. I learned this early on in my own, through my own experience as certain things happen. Let me just say, you have foster kids come into your house, there's an element of chaos that you invite into your home. There totally is. And some of these kids come with oppressive spirits and they come with habits of learned behavior some of a lot of them have mental health challenges. All of them have been traumatized at one level. A lot of them, most of them, multiple levels. But as I was setting some things in order, it'd be in agreement with our wife. We go, this is the vision we have for our home. Our family goes to church. That's what our family does. And we come into agreement on it. So part of setting the vision is this. What I get to see is what I was able to see last Sunday morning as I saw my wife and all three of my kids standing up together, clapping their hands and praising the Lord. And that's a realization of a vision as a leader in my home. And I don't get to see as much of it as I would like to see, but it gives me a glimpse Leaders set direction, which means they cast vision and they outline a course. This is where we're going and this is how we're going to get there. Number two, they, they find the right people. You got to have the right people, church. Can you say amen? We don't get far uh, if we don't have the right people, which means sometimes we got to recruit people. We got to invite. We got to ask people to be a part of this. As we're giving invitations here in ministry, it's an invitation to recruit, to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Everybody else is trying to join a club or a gang or a social function so they can be a part of something bigger. Let's be a part of the biggest thing going on in the world today, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's do our part here in Hutchinson, in Hutchinson Kansas. And we also work to retain. Why? Because we're investing in hearts. Can you say amen? And sometimes you have to release, but it's a whole lot better if you can retain. We release into roles, and the roles don't always stay the same. Because we start out, we start out picking up trash, flushing toilets, washing glasses, checking the sound system, making sure that it is important that our church, all the doors are locked at the end of the day. It is important. Can you say amen? We have ushers and deacons that show up here to church an hour before service, get things in order, and then they stay a half hour, 45 minutes after church is over and don't, like for me, I'll start turning off lights because I'm ready to go home. But others, and be thankful we have other gracious people here, they'll, they'll let us have our conversations for a half hour, 45 minutes and wait till the last people leave before they lock the doors. Why? Because it's ministry to the body, because if we leave the doors open, then we're subject to people coming in, and we've had that happen before, and it's been a long time, and we continue to pray that it doesn't happen again, but hey, a lock, a lock like my dad said, a lock just keeps the honest thieves honest. 
So we want to at least keep the honest thieves honest. But those become important parts and we release into roles. It starts out at something, then it's being faithful in those little things and setting up chairs. Hey, uh, we need these set up by 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon, these tables and chairs set up by 3 o'clock. And then they're done. And you, and you get there the next morning and everything that you asked for is completed. And that's like, oh, that person's trustworthy. And they're faithful. And they keep their word. And they're doing it with gladness in their heart. And they're not, they're not begrudgingly doing it. That is such a blessing to have, a people that you can depend upon. Can you say amen? And, not, and you're releasing the roles, and then it may be doing this and doing this, and it's teaching children's church, being a part of the worship team, sharing on a Wednesday night, opening a service in prayer, closing the service in prayer, an opportunity to share testimony. It's all, it's not like this, it's this progression of this is on a higher this is at a, a higher place of the hierarchy than this, and these higher things are more, more to be esteemed than these lower level things. So I'll say this, no matter what role God has us in, be content with what God has called us to do. Amen. And then if he opens a door, step into it. If there's another role, fulfill it. If there's an opportunity to grow, there's always a little bit of fear and trepidation involved into it. But if he's called us, that means he's equipped us. And what he's equipped us with, he's enabled us. And if he's enabled us, he's empowered us. So leaders, set the direction. They work with the right people. They establish a, ver a purpose that's tied to the vision. We talk about this all the time here. We're here so we can touch hearts and change lives. Our big reason here, why are we here? Touch hearts, change, change lives. Uh, be a, a refuge for the weary and oasis of refreshing. For people to come in with hurting hearts, souls that have been tattered by this world, to come in and receive refreshing, to be a place where we can come together as community and not have to be at an educational level or socioeconomic status or know the right people. Guess what? None of us are able to go out to the country club on our own. Can you say amen? If I take my golf clubs and I head up to Prairie Dunes and say, I want a round, one of the nicest golf courses in the entire nation, they're going to go, denied, you're not a part of our club. But we'll p let you be a part of our club if you give us tens of thousands of dollars every single year. It becomes exclusive. And that's a huge barrier for entry. And as a church, we get to bring all people in. Can you say amen? Yes. Touching hearts, changing lives. Oasis of refreshing, a refuge for the weary. These are all important things as we go out. Everything that we do here is tied to these things. The ministry to the nursery kids is about touching their hearts and changing their lives. Why, so, why is that so important? Because these, these young kids, they need to know that there's people who love them, that care for them, that are watching out for them, that are nurturing them. A good children's church teacher who's teaching Jesus on their level. I always use this example. Uh, when Isaiah was three years old, having a hard time, super hard time, and Sister Mary was, had been his preschool teacher for a long time, Isaiah, three or four years old. can't remember exactly. He's three or four years old. He was talking. And Sister Mary, who, who does great working with the kids, was able to take him out because, like, he was one of the runner kids. Like, my kids were runners, too. And she takes him off to the side and just starts talking with him. And here Isaiah is at three, four years old, is able to outline the entire plan of salvation to his teacher. That Jesus loves him. And Jesus died for him. And Jesus forgave him from his sin, from, forgave Isaiah of his sins. And that Jesus rose from the dead. And that Jesus is his Lord. At four years old, 40 years old. That's saving faith. Can you say amen? amen? And it was teachers over time, mom and dad too, and other people, but given the word at their level. And we continue to do that over and over, all the way through the youth, through us tonight. We develop a team. It takes everybody to be a part of it. It means we collaborate, we delegate, not... Not every decision made here is unilateral. Can you say amen? 
I've, we've del- Pastor Lori has authority to pick the songs that we sing. Occasionally, Pastor Jim and I will make a special request, but we try not to do that all the time. Why? Because she's empowered to pick the songs, and we get to be her band. <laughs> Why? Because that role and responsibility has been delegated, and she takes that role and responsibility very, very seriously. There's not a worship service that we have that isn't prayed over that isn't meditated on, that isn't practiced even before we have our regular worship practice, that isn't practiced through uh, in the privacy of, of a home or going through a mental exercise, that it's not just flippantly like, ah, oh, let's just pick, let's just pick six of the most popular songs that we could do. No, it's like, oh, Holy Spirit, what are you, what are you going to minister to the people? Is that not true? Like, God, this song is resonating, this one song, and I really feel that it's going to minister to God's people. God, what, not only this song, but what other songs that go along with it that's going to, going to support that? And that becomes one, one component of a team because we all can't do it together. We have multiple pastors here, which is, which is a tremendous blessing because while one's preaching, we can do ministry at, at various levels. We have our women's ministers we develop a team. It requires structure. We need organization versus disorganization. Order over disorder, and we do not micromanage. A couple more things. We support, which means we encourage. We build up. We don't beat down. Can you say amen? We build up. Like when we see Josiah tonight, like, the dumb people would go, well, he didn't sing that loud. And it wasn't perfectly in key and in tune. And you're like, shut up. Right? Don't be the negative Nancy. Like, you're eight years old, standing in front of an audience of people. You want to be a support. And you go, you know what? That blessed my heart when I saw you up there standing next to your dad. And it was awesome that I got to sing your favorite song with you to Jesus. And it blessed me because I saw the big picture, not just, not just picking out the notes or the phrasing or this. No, it, it's, it becomes something that's like, oh, this is, this is awesome. We build up. We don't beat down. Because if we beat down in a moment of somebody's vulnerability, it may scare them from ever doing anything again. As we see some of our young people that start out singing a solo and they're... They're kind of quiet and they're meek and they're a little bit timid. I've never, never sang in front of people, so I can't judge at all. But it starts out for their first few times. It's, it's a little bit meek, it's a little bit mild. But all of a sudden as they yield their talents and abilities to the Lord and the Holy Spirit empowers them, then all of a sudden it becomes ministry to multiple people. And if we criticize those days of small beginnings, we become that little fox that spoils the vine. And we cut off something that God wants to do in the life of someone else. Had this shared with me a long time ago. A long time ago. We're going to wrap up here, here pretty soon. Um, something that I was preaching a long, long time ago. 10, 15 years ago. And criticism got back to me. As I'm preaching... And I know I've gotten better through the years, but I didn't, I didn't think I was ever a bad preacher. Like, I never thought I was bad. But I could, we can always get better. Can you say amen? Um, and someone offered criticism that somebody else overheard that got back to me and goes, that Craig, he, he's, an okay, he's an okay teacher, but he's not a good preacher. And it's like, does, does that build someone up? Look, set, it, set it in the middle of my, of my preaching. Like, it's one thing to say it at lunch as you're having roast pastor, but, but don't say it in the congregation. Like, that's a level of, that's a level of boldness that, that gets onto the area of being capricious and just, yeah, it 
but it, a couple of things that it really hurt me on. Number one, it kind of becomes a dart to me, and I'll take my own darts. But the fact that it got shared with someone else, that it could change somebody else's opinion of what good preaching or teaching is, because a comment like that gets overheard by someone who's taking notes and is just really into it and going, this is great. This is great manna. This is exactly what I need to hear. And they hear the voice of someone older go, ah, it's not that good. And then they start to question what they're own hearing. And it can beat something, beat someone down instead of building someone up. So we always want to build people up. Can you say amen? It's... It, we can squash those things, and this is what it did. Number one, that person didn't stay here at the church very long. Praise Jesus. A member. Yeah, a member. Number two, this is what happened. It, it, put, it produced an anxiety in me because I'm not a conflict person. I hate conflict. I grew up with enough conflict. I do not like conflict at any different level. I will work to avoid conflict if it's all possible. That's me. Um, I was going into taking my lunch break, and I was going into Taco Bell for tacos. It wasn't a Tuesday, but tacos are good any day. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be Tuesday to eat tacos. I was going in for my tacos, and I saw them sitting there in the restaurant. I guess you can't really call Taco Bell a restaurant, but he was sitting there. And I go to walk in the door, and I turned and walked out because I, I didn't want him to see me. And I got out to the truck, and I felt about this small because I ran. And then I got mad because I let someone else and something else get between me and tacos. <laughs> and it was, it was that moment that I refused to let anyone or anything else get between me and tacos if I'm really looking forward to tacos. But it's, it's uh, my... my, my uh, my app, my my document here is recording me as I'm talking. Um, the, the big purpose is is that that dart, because of not only how it affected me, but how it could have affected other people, produced an anxiety inside of me, and it was a conflict that needed to be resolved. And I resolved it in my own heart. Did I go up to him and tell him, "You fool! How could you say something like that?" No, I let the Lord deal with him. But I also had to let the Lord deal with me. And go, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe God more than I'm going to believe the word of a fool. And I say those things are foolish. Hallelujah. We build up. We don't be down. We encourage. We provide tools. And we also do, do this. This is, the, this is the hard part for some people that want to get something done. If you want to get something done, you're going to have to have a relationship. And it's not easy. You have to have a relationship. What, what, what relationship does is it provides accountability. I'm accountable to my wife because I'm in a relationship with her. I'm accountable to our pastors because we're in relationship together. And sometimes people don't want to have accountability, so they just don't form a relationship. It, it's about mutual submission that's born out of respect for one another. People don't get, people don't get the submission because when they hear the word submission, they immediately think to subjugation. I'm submitted to the elders of this church, and it's voluntarily and it's willfully. Can you say amen? It's, it's voluntarily submitting to one another, mutual submission born out of respect. And sometimes there are certain things that like, sometimes certain things just need to happen because that's what gets asked and that's the way it needs to happen. And you don't have to go through the 10, 10 slides of PowerPoint to justify every decision because we don't got time to make all the decisions. Like, why do I want the chair straight? Well, partly because I like our, our sanctuary to look decently and in order. That's why I like it. And I also think this, that if we give attention to the small things to bless people, that God looks down on that as another act of worship. And it means like, oh, they, they care about the house of God to that level where they care if the chairs. Are. And some of you guys may not think that it's important. And that's cool if you don't. But I like them to be 
Pastor Lori likes everything to be in tune. Why? Because when I'm a half step out of tune and she's pl saying play the G and I am playing the G, she's, I'm not actually playing the G. She wants me to be in tune. Why? Because it helps make the song better. So when she says, Pastor Craig, are you ready to tune? I go, yes, I am. And we tune. Respect. Last thing is here is we trust. Let's let, we're going to close with this one, and let's look at Psalm 23. We talk about leadership in the church. This is where it's born out of. It's our under the leadership of the Lord, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And no, very few Psalms encapsulates the leadership of the Lord more that I think than Psalm 23. This isn't the psalm, I know this is the psalm that often gets shared at funerals, um, but this song is much more than a psalm to be shared after one of the saints has their last day. But it's a psalm that we should remember most days. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The shepherding of the Lord denotes a leadership and dependence upon the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which means he's our provider. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. As we lie down, that means he causes me to rest. Leads me besides the still waters, which means where he goes, there's peace. He restores my soul. We can be strong in body, but weak in spirit and weary in soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It means he's our ever-present help in our time of need. He's not leaving us, nor is he forsaking us. valley of shadow of death is dark times. No matter what time we're going through, we have no reason to fear any evil because he's our cloud by day and our fire by night. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff is correction and guidance. We go to the word for correction and guidance. Can you say amen? We take comfort in God's correction. Even our kids, even ourselves, we ought to take comfort in correction. We may not feel like it in the moment, but to go back to the story relayed to me by my, by my oldest, got adopted into a new family. And Em and I provided him correction and guidance through the years. Correction and guidance that he may not have got from that family. And he may not have liked it when we took away his cord, playing Xbox, when he was violating rules. In fact, he had such good friends that they'd come over and bring their cords so they could all play together. Right, Gabe? But later on, they appreciate that comfort, that correction, that guidance, that you, you loved me enough to tell me no. And God loves us enough to tell us no. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Even as Pastor Jim was preaching on the anointing, the believer's anointing here a couple Wednesdays ago. This anointing with oil is, isn't isn't the bottle of Wesson that Roger Pate broke out 25th in Washington. Here, I'll tell the story real quick because it's a good one. Roger Pate, a Pentecostal minister that came here, it's been 25, 30 years ago. Is before is at our other building at 26th in Washington, and we're having an anointing service. And we're like, sweet, because we got our little 
we got our little bottle we get up here and Pastor Jim and I will do the, we'll get you a little dab and make sure you get a little bit of the fragrance on there because that fragrance becomes a reminder, though, this is special. This is, this is, Connie, you were there. Um, you get, you get a little like, oh, that smells good. It changes how, it's like, oh, we're doing something different. Well, Roger didn't bring out like the little bottle. He brought out like the bottle of Wesson oil, like the quart bottle. And we're used to just going like, like if we're, if we're anointing because we look, like we'll do the, just get a little, there we go, good. He was like, no, opened up his hands and poured it till his, it was running down on the carpet. On the carpet. And I know Sean's going back there going like, because eh, we know. And, and then, then it's like a slather. And it's, like, and it's not just like a single hand on the forehead. It's like both hands covered in oil on the face. So be appreciative that we don't mess your makeup up uh, to that degree here. But it's a service I'll never forget that service. Well, here's, here's, here's how you know it's God. Because it's not just someone talking about the signs and wonders and doing something different, but the anointing and the Holy Spirit backs it up. I'm all for things that, I'm for things that are of God that don't always look exactly the way it should when it's backed up with the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. If it's just weird for the sake of being weird, I ain't got time for that. Can you say Amen. Another thing, so that was an awesome service. Roger, one of the first services we had over here when we invited Roger. Um, again, it's been 20 over 20 years ago. I'm ushering, I'm probably Gabe's age or probably younger than Gabe. And I'm ministering in the prayer line. And it's just like from that corner all the way, we used to have baptismal to this door over here. People lined up. And it was just the touch and fall, touch and fall, touch and fall. On the steps, everything. And I'm like, us ushers are like, we're just like, like we ran out of prayer cloths. And then, and I'm the good usher, and I'm like, I'm here to serve first. And I'm, and he's like, keep going, make sure nobody falls and cracks their coconut. I mean, and then it's also like, try to help people up too. And I'm coming down and I'm all the way back over here by the corner on this top of the stage there. And I am, I remember I'm 17, maybe 17, 18 years old. I, as Roger, I'm the last one because I've been helping catch people as they go down. Nobody else knows this is going on because they're all slain in the spirit. I'm the last one. And I remember he's reaching out his hand to lay his hand on me and I'm stepping back. <laughs> like I don't want to be prayed for in that moment because I'm there to serve and help people. Now, I'll wait till the end when all the, everybody else has been served. And I couldn't step back fast enough, lays his hand on me. I go down immediately. <laughs> Power of God on this step, probably laying over back arch. I was under 20, so my body could do those things without consequences. And, and all I can remember as I'm laying there, slaying in the spirit, in my mind, I'm going, I got to get up. I got to get up. I got to get up. There's people that need help. <laughs> by his beyond help by then. So when he's, when he's, t it, it, but here's the other thing, all for it. When it's God. If it's just weird to be weird, I don't got time for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was one of those like, we're hanging on. But when it's God, it's an awesome thing. Can you say amen? And here's the thing. It was God and nobody got their nose out of joint. I mean, when it gets weird, I get my nose out of joint. And I'm also open to correction when needed. Hallelujah. You prepare, back to verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. This anointing with the head of oil would be of the balm of Gilead as a shepherd is tending to a sheep that would be caught in the briars. And they had anoint with a, a special oil that not only, um, not only did it bring healing through the medicinal properties of it, but it also keep the pest and the things that would, uh, would try to attach itself to the sheep. My cup runs over. 
One of my favorite songs we sing is Fill My Cup, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this weariness in my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, I lift it up. Can you say amen? amen? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. This is who we are. This is what we do. Where I go, good things happen because God's with me. All the days of my life. Not just today, but every day. And my last day is going to be the best day. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The pattern for, biblical, pattern for leadership in the church is patterned after the leadership that God gives us. We're shepherds, we're servants. Um, we lead, we provide rest. We're on a path. We walk together with each other as we go through various shadows of our life. We receive the correction of God's word. We are thankful for the table that God prepares for us. The anointing that he places upon our head that we fills our cup to overflowing. And the goodness and mercy that's upon our lives each and every day. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because there's no place I'd rather be. Even a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord for one day is better than a thousand elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Brother Gabe, you can close us in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for a great pastor of this Lord and for this church. Thank you for always being faithful that we can always rely on you and trust in you, Jesus, and give our lives to you, Lord. Uh, thank you for tonight and uh, at the beginning of this next week, Lord, I pray that we go and we're, we're, we're ready to face the week and ready to, ready to, uh, to fight the battles, Lord, and, and to give our battles to you, Jesus. And, Lord, I just thank you for all you do, Lord. I thank you for being our Savior and dying for us. And we believe that you resurrected, Lord, and you're risen, Lord, and you're Lord over us and you're a good God, Jesus. Thank you for everything, Lord. Jesus, amen. 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 God bless you all. We love you. We'll see you here Tuesday night or Wednesday night. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Be blessed.